It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My first question is to the Premier. Last night, parents watched with dismay as the Ford government scuttled any hope of a resolution that would keep schools open today. Last night, the minister claimed he had presented a new offer to high school teachers at the bargaining table, only to admit hours later that no offer had been made. Why did the Ford government tell the public they had made an offer, when in reality the government made no effort whatsoever to avert today's strike? The Deputy Premier. Referred to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this strike is not fair to parents or students in this province. We've been clear through this process. We want to turn to private mediation to get a deal. Parents deserve predictability, Mr. Speaker. Throughout this process, the government has made significant moves. From online learning, we announced a change from four of the mandate to two. That was rejected. On, with respect to classroom sizes, we've announced a move from 28 provincialized average to 25. That was rejected, Mr. Speaker. Member for Hamilton East Stony Creek will withdraw. What do I say? Withdraw, I guess. I don't know. Minister of Education. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the, the point is, is that we remain focused on getting a deal because parents deserve that predictability. It is unacceptable that this strike is proceeding, given that there's a tool in the toolbox, private mediation that worked for QP. We hope in good faith, and I remain hopeful that the unions will accept this, we can get a deal, and provide predictability for the children of this province. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, what seemed clear to parents watching last night is that teachers were waiting at the bargaining table, ready to work, while the Ford government was organizing yet another press conference for their minister, one where the minister claimed he had make, made an offer that he, in fact, had never made. Why is the government working so hard to avoid blame here, Speaker, when they could have been working hard to actually resolve this mess? Minister, to reply. Uh, Mr. Speaker, every time our government has made significant, reasonable proposals in good faith to the OSSTF, not only have they rejected our proposals, but actually neglected to advance any new proposals since the first day our bargaining commenced. Mr. Speaker, you can't have it both ways. They cannot outright reject every proposal of the government, but not bring any new proposal to the table. The onus is on OSSTF to bring forth a new option if they reject the current ones we've changed. Mr. Speaker, we've made many proposal ch changes to our proposals because we are listening to parents. And Mr. Speaker, our commitment to the parents of this province to stand with them as against escalation. Their kids deserve to be in class. I remain hopeful we can get a deal because parents, students, and the teachers themselves should be in class today. Period. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, here's what people see. The Ford government rolled into office and announced they'd be firing 10,000 teachers. They said larger classes Order. would make Order. students tougher. Yeah, well. They said Alabama-style mandatory online learning was coming to Ontario, to and they attacked teachers who disagreed with them. Now they're scrambling to avoid blame for the job action that they have been pushing for since day one. So why won't the Ford government stop putting their energy into avoiding blame and start working to avoid further strikes by fixing this mess that they have put us all in? Minister? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think parents in Ontario know that irrespective of the political party and the government of the day, the union, teacher unions and their leadership choose to escalate, irrespective of the Premier. That is what unites Bob Ray, Kathleen Wynne, Mike Harris sure. and Kathleen Wynne, as well as now Doug Ford. That is the fact, and parents know it to be true. However, Mr. Speaker, with respect to how we move forward, we look to an, a private mediator, a mechanism we used just months, a month ago with CUPE to get a deal. Mr. Speaker, what is true through the process is that they have not made any new proposals, but in addition to that, they have sort of in their position on the increase in compensation to $1.5 billion across teacher tables. We're offering for taxpayers a $750 million increase. Teachers are well compensated, the second highest in the country. We value their work. Mr. Speaker, $750 million is a reasonable offer. However, they've insisted to get a deal requires a $1.5 billion increase. Response. We think that's unreasonable. We're going to continue to focus on our students and invest in their futures. Thank you very much. 
The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, my next question is also to the Premier. You know, an agreement can only be reached through a fair bargaining process, but this government is ignoring the key issues. Teachers are worried about class sizes, and so are parents. Teachers are worried about e-learning, and so are students. Teachers would rather be instructing kids, and yet this government has always wanted to pick a fight. Will this government stop? ignoring the key issues and get back to the bargaining table with a sincere effort to fix the mess and re reverse their damaging cuts. Deputy Premier, refer to the Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it is under this government that we've increased public expenditure in the defense of public education at the highest levels ever recorded. We're on track to spend $1.2 billion more this year than we did last year. Mr. Speaker, with respect to classroom sizes, the evidence overwhelmingly suggests that in the early years, classroom sizes ought to be smaller. Under our government, we are maintaining the smallest classroom sizes for the early years of education for the youngsters of this province. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to the provincial average, we moved that from 28 to 25, and that was opposed by unions. We moved the online. We announce an online change to the online courses rather from four to two that was rejected mr speaker the constant is the escalation by unions uh, the union leadership rather against students and the casualty of these impacts are them out of class today and i'd hope every member of the legislature would oppose further escalation stand with parents Spons. we remain hopeful we remain hopeful on getting deals to keep kids in class supplementary question Speaker, all the members of this government need to do is look in the mirror to see what escalation looks like. They started picking the fight a year ago. Speaker. Across Ontario this morning, however, working moms and dads had to scramble for childcare options, which are tricky to pin down at the best of times, Speaker. And some parents have had to take a vac vacation day or go a day without pay, all because this government has created chaos in our education system. This strike Order. absolutely could have been avoided. Why has the Ford government added more chaos into the hectic lives of working families at the same time they can least afford it? Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition has so appropriately underscored why this government believes that strikes hurt kids, and that's why, Mr. Speaker, we're working hard at the table. We're going to stay at the table. We're looking to private mediation in order to get a deal. Now, I find it bizarre that the teacher union leadership would make a decision to escalate, to keep kids out of class today, knowing that there's a tool in the toolkit that can keep students in class by getting a voluntary agreement. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to invest in public education. We're going to continue to be reasonable at the table. We're going to continue to show a student-centric posture because kids in this province should be in class. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, students are lo uh, losing out on a day of instruction today, and the government could have absolutely avoided this, but they'd rather have a showdown with teachers and education workers in this province than keep the classrooms open. The government knew of the negative impacts on students, but chose to go down this path. In fact, they chose this path some time ago, just like they chose to introduce M uh, Alabama-style e-learning, even though the evidence suggests that it's not going to work. Why has the government pushed this narrow, ideological approach to education rather than what is best for the students of Ontario? Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have made a decision to, to be reasonable at the table. It's why we moved from a mandate of four to two. Mr. Speaker, we're also ensuring more time for students to be able to take more online courses, a gold standard of online courses, to provide more STEM-focused classes for students, particularly in rural and remote parts of the province. Every student will benefit from higher class options and more time to do that. But, Mr. Speaker, fundamentally, the issue at the table is not about online learning, because the day we made that announcement, it was swiftly rejected. What it is increasingly about is compensation, a request, a demand by the unions for a $1.5 billion increase to teacher pay, the second highest paid in the nation, and we value their work, Speaker. But we think, as taxpayers, the fair option, the right option forward is to put more money in the front of Gordon. class to help our kids succeed. That's the priority of our government, and I hope all members of the legislature will stand with us as we invest in the future of our province. The next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. For over a year, this government has pushed forward a radical agenda for our schools, one that's asking students and families to settle for less. Fewer teachers, fewer courses, and fewer resources to support their learning. Their plan pushes kids into a risky, online e-learning experiment while eliminating 10,000 caring adults in our schools. But instead of backing down, 
The minister has only doubled down, and today their devastating cuts have led to the first province-wide strike by education workers in this province in 22 years. Wow. Speaker, did the minister really think this would end any other way? Mm. Questions addressed to the Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and to the member. It is clear, obviously, the strikes hurt kids. It's regrettable that they're out of class today, and we stand with parents against any further escalation. The fact is, Speaker, they need all parties to be reasonable. They need all parties to be reasonable and to focus on their kids, not on ourselves. And, Mr. Speaker, that's why we made a decision to move from 28 provincialized average to 25. It's why we announced a move on online learning from four mandates to two. It's why we've added another $200 million in new investment in the front of class just a month ago in the fall economic statement. We're going to continue to invest in education, defend the future of our province, ensure the students of this province can get ahead. We're going to do that at the table and remain hopeful we can get a deal through private mediation. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, perhaps if the minister dedicated as much energy to negotiations as he does to defending this premier's cuts, here, we here. wouldn't be in here, this here. position. In Interview after interview, he's complained about the lack of a deal, all the while he couldn't be bothered to show up at the bargaining table to try to reach one. Speaker, Ontarians have made themselves abundantly clear. They don't want this government's cuts to our classrooms. Will the minister drop the spin, work today to keep this to a one-day strike, and reverse his cuts to our classrooms? Minister. Speaker, the parents of this province have been abundantly clear that they oppose escalation that keeps their kids out of class. And I ask members opposite to stand with them against further escalation because kids should be in class. Mr. Speaker, the focus of this government is to be reasonable, to be focused on getting deals. We did this with CUPE. We turned to a private mediator. And I'm asking OSSTF in good faith to do so. The fact is they put a priority on a $1.5 billion compensation increase where we think taxpayers, it is reasonable and it is fair to give them a 1% increase, a $750 million increase, while ensuring additional dollars go to help our kids get ahead. That's the focus of the government. We're going to continue to be reasonable, but most importantly, Speaker, we're going to continue to focus on keeping kids in class. Thank you. The next question, the member for Etobicoke Lake. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, parents across my riding of Etobicoke Lakeshore and across Ontario fell victim to significant disruptions in their lives at their hands at the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation. The OSSTF's irresponsible one-day strike has created headaches for parents and students alike, with many parents scrambling to find childcare options for their children. Parents know the best way for their child to reach their full potential is to remain in the classroom. Strack action caused by unions impedes the learning environment. The union may think this Order. posturing will help it win at the bargaining table, but this strike only is putting our children at a disadvantage. Order. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Education tell the Legislature where the question. government stands on the OSSTF's one-day strike. The question is addressed to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore for the question. Mr. Speaker, 100 per cent of parents want their kids to be in class today, and every member of this government agrees. It is why, Mr. Speaker, we stand with parents against escalation. Uh, and regrettably, it seems to be we're the only political party that has made that clear in this legislature. Speaker, for 205 days, we started bargaining. Months ago, the OSSCF has tabled a proposal. They've not made any changes at all. Our government has, however, on online learning, for classroom sizes, for new investments, and new, and new commitments when it comes to mental health and STEM education. Mr. Speaker, the focus of our government is to get deals that keep kids in class. And contrary to the assertions by the members opposite, that we're going to continue to invest more in public education than any government in the history of this province. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, I firmly believe the spirit of compromise must prevail if we're going to reach an agreement. So I am tremendously encouraged that our government has been reasonable and student-centric and is calling on unions to provide predictability to parents. But I think there's a lot of confusion about what's really going on, Mr. Speaker. I've heard from parents who are upset, and as a step-parent, we want our kids in school. Parents and guardians aren't sure why teachers are on strike today. Parents want answers. They deserve answers because the minister is right. Strikes do indeed hurt our children. Could the minister please give an example or two that demonstrates how the government has been reasonable and flexible in these negotiations? Order. 
Minister to reply. Mr. Speaker, this strike, led and initiated by the teachers' union, is unfair for parents and unfair for students. Mr. Speaker, Order. the singular victim of strikes led by teacher union leadership are our kids, the most vulnerable in our classroom. And for middle and low-income families, choosing childcare, finding childcare is very difficult. We find it unacceptable that they are put in this position. Mr. Speaker, our focus is to get a deal through mediation. We actually remain hopeful and focused on getting a deal, ensuring our team stays at the table through our mediator to get a deal that provides predictability. Mr. Speaker, we've reduced our classroom size average. We've reduced the online learning amount from four to two. We've invested more in education than any government in the history of this problem. Order. We're going to continue to focus on our kids. We're going to continue to focus on getting deals that provide predictability for the province, for every child in this province. This question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you and good morning, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. It's not just high school students losing a day of education today. In communities across Ontario, elementary and secondary schools are also closed. For example, the Ottawa Citizen reports that parents are scrambling to find care for their kids as schools across the Ottawa region close for the day. These parents don't want to hear the Minister of Education play the blame game, and they certainly don't want to hear him talk about making offers that were actually never made. When will the Ford government stop playing politics with these negotiations and start reaching a real deal? The Deputy Premier the Minister of Education. and refer to the Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. In the context of the families in Ottawa region, I'm proud to report, Mr. Speaker, that all four boards in Ottawa have received increased expenditure from the government, in addition to the province-wide commitment to increase spending by over $1.2 billion this year than we did last year. Mr. Speaker, we're committed to getting a deal. And for the families in Ottawa, for families in every region of this province, it is unacceptable. It is unacceptable, Speaker. The teacher union leaders Order. have decided to escalate hurting our kids. Mr. Speaker, we stand with parents against escalation. We call on unions to stay at the table, to stay focused on getting a deal that provides predictability that ensures children in this province remain in class. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And back to the Premier. In Ottawa alone, classes are cancelled for about 100,000 uh, elementary and secondary school students. In my community, hundreds of students will be missing school across the Peel region. Parents are scrambling and they are frustrated, Speaker. And the government's response is to hold press conferences about offers that they actually never made. When will the Ford government stop playing games, admit that their reckless cuts have created a crisis and chaos in our classrooms, and make a sincere offer to resolve this issue at the bargaining table. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to continue to reaffirm my commitment to examining innovative solutions to avoid a strike. I'm open to a framework from the teachers' union that reaches the goal of keeping our kids in class. I've said that for months, Mr. Speaker. That remains true today. I've also asserted that there is a legitimate interest in seeking a private mediator as a mechanism to get a deal. Parents deserve to have that predictability. And the fact that families in this province have to contend with a strike led and initiated by the teachers' union leadership is unacceptable. We stand with them against escalation. We will continue to invest Order. in education. We'll continue to be at the table. We will never turn our backs on our students, and we will fight hard to ensure students of this province remain in class. Next question, the member for Simcoe Gray. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the uh, Minister of Health. The Minister, for a year now, the town of Wasaga Beach has operated and funded uh, an after-hours medical clinic as a trial project. The clinic has been well received, and the residents of Wasaga Beach and the broader health community would like to see it continue. Mayor Bolfucci, Council and Town staff are working collaboratively with the Lynn, the Community Health Centre, General Marine Hospital and the Family Health Organization to find a way to extend the clinic beyond December 30th. There is, of course, a cost to operating the clinic and municipal taxpayers can't bear the burden of this cost alone. Uh, with the news that a local doctor has just recently had his uh, license suspended, uh, the need for the clinic is even greater. So I ask the uh, minister, Mr. Speaker, if the government could provide some immediate financial assistance so the clinic can remain operational in 2020 until the town pursues and is successful with a doctor recruitment campaign. 
The question is addressed to the Minister of Health. Well, I thank the member very much for his question, and we are certainly aware of the situation in Wasega Beach, and we are committed to making sure that everyone in Ontario who needs a primary care provider is, is given that opportunity. We do have initiatives in place that are designed to assist local communities and organizations to recruit physicians and improve the geographic distribution of physicians and services, and we also offer residency training to internationally trained physicians uh, for in exchange change for a commitment for them to practice medicine in a community other than in Ottawa and Toronto. So we do have some initiatives in place and our plan to transform our public health care system is also going to improve the coordination of every aspect of patient care. I'll offer some more suggestions in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Minister, uh, for that answer. Uh, as you know, the shortage of family physicians is rather acute in, in my riding at this time. And to highlight uh, the need there, I just want to quote from some constituents. Dino from Wasaga Beach writes, uh, just found out that our doctor is being suspended, which leaves us without a doctor, yet Wasaga is closing its after-hour clinic. Where is the justice here? Susan from Wasaga Beach says, quote, the Wasaga Beach pilot project for the after-hours clinic will come to a close at the end of December. Demand has been clearly demonstrated. What are the provincial funding plans for this clinic? And Joel wrote to me on November 5th, and he says, my family, wife and two children, moved up here a year ago, and we're still without a family doctor. We've been on the list with Healthcare Connect, but there doesn't seem to be anything we can do. And so, Minister, perhaps in the supplementary, uh, you could tell us whether the government is able to help us out with the clinic. Uh, it needs to operate for at least a few more Question. months until we can attract some doctors to Wasaga Beach. And again, with the help of your ministry, we'd like to do just that. <laughs> Minister. I thank you for the question, and uh, as you know, in the future, Ontario health teams will be responsible for delivering all of their patients' care, making sure it's connected and integrated, and they will improve care in communities like Wasaga Beach, but I recognize that's not an answer for right now. So I look forward to working with you and your community to see what can be done to make sure that with the uh, this one physician now being out of the picture, to see what can be done with the existing clinic to continue it on. In until other arrangements are made for new physicians to come into the community. So um, I would appreciate the opportunity to speak with you later about that, but we look forward to working with you, as I say. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Mississauga Centre. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Transportation. As our population in the region of Peel and around the GTA increases, it is imperative that we continue investing in our transit and highway infrastructure to keep up with economic demands. Highway 401, as we know, is a major artery in our region and sees hundreds of thousands of commuters and commercial vehicles each and every day. Gridlock and heavy traffic make traveling frustrating for us all. And under our government, we have seen some historical improvements and investments that are reducing congestion and finally getting Ontario moving. How is the associate minister continuing to solve gridlock challenges in the GTA, including in my city of Mississauga? Questions to the Associate Minister of Transportation. Thank GTA. you very much to the member for the question, Mr. Speaker. As the Associate Minister of Transportation for the Greater Toronto Area, it is my responsibility, my priority, to encourage our government to make key, infra, uh, key investments in critical infrastructure to get Ontarians moving. Last week, I joined my Mississauga and Brampton colleagues to announce a $640 million investment in the widening of Highway 401 in one of its busiest stretches. This project includes the widening of an 18-kilometer stretch on 401 from Credit River in Mississauga to Regional Road 25 in Milton and will also include the reconstruction of bridges and other features. Mr. Speaker, the 401 is one of the busiest highways in North America. It is absolutely critical that we continue to invest in this highway so that we can provide relief for commuters and also so that we can ensure uh, we improve economic development across this province. The supplementary question. Through you, Speaker, I thank the Minister for her answer and for her hard work in making our morning commute just a little easier. Mr. Speaker, approximately 250,000 vehicles travel on Highway 401 in Peel and Halton regions on a daily basis. And the section of Highway 401 between Mississauga and Milton that she mentioned is one of the busiest stretches of highway in the GTA. 
It affects the lives of so many workers and hardworking families and business owners in Ontario. I know that my residents and constituents are welcoming this important project with open arms. With that said, when can we expect to see the completion of the $640 million project, Minister? Minister. Thank you to the member for the question. I'm very pleased to announce that construction is already well underway and drivers will be able to expect to use the expanded highway by the end of 2022. Commuters will, be, will expect to see a mix of 12 and 10 lane collector system from Credit River in Mississauga to Regional Road uh, 25 in Milton, and this will also include a median HOV lane. Mr. Speaker, every, everyone recognizes how busy the 401 is. This is why this is absolutely critical to ease congestion and improve the traffic flow along the 401 and ease that congestion on the west side of the GTA. Our government recognizes how critical these investments are so that we can get Ontarians moving. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. Earlier this week, the Conservative member for Mississauga Centre signed a letter stating that, as a registered nurse, she calls on Windsor's police chief to demand a consumption and treatment service site in Windsor. The member for Mississauga Centre wrote, and I quote, Accidental opioid-related overdoses are killing sons and daughters, moms and dads, friends, neighbours, co-workers. Nurses urge you to use your office to help put an end to this public health crisis in your community. Saving lives is everyone's job. Speaker, I couldn't agree more. These sites save lives. Windsor's Public Health Unit issued three alerts for high overdose-related emergency department visits in the first two weeks of November alone. Will the Deputy P Premier, who is also the Minister of Health, listen to the advice from her caucus colleague and fund a consumption and treatment service site in Windsor? The question is to the Minister of Health. Well, I thank the member very much for the question. There is no uh, issue about the opioids issue that we're facing in Ontario right now. It's happening in communities across the province. What we need to do, though, is to make sure that we respond to the applications that we receive. We have received and set up already 16 consumption treatment services sites. We are waiting for municipalities to submit their applications to us, and when they do, we will review them and we will apply the same criteria that we've applied to the previous 16. So we uh, await any news or any applications that we will receive from Windsor. If there's a serious concern there, which I have no doubt of what you're saying, we want to be able to help and we want to be able to make sure that people can receive the wraparound treatment services that they need in order to be able to uh, re remove themselves from not taking opioids anymore, but also to be able to receive the other Once. health and social service treatment services that they need. Member for Parkdale High Park, supplementary. Back to the Deputy Premier. It's not just the member from Mississauga Centre who echoes the calls made by New Democrats, healthcare professionals, frontline crisis workers, and those with lived experience. This past summer, the member from Peterborough Kawartha said that he would help gather 10,000 signatures and bring a petition to Queen's Park to request a consumption and treatment site in Peterborough. Are the members from Peterborough Kawartha and Mississauga Centre knowingly giving Ontarians false hope that help is on the Way, or is the minister finally ready to reverse her course? I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. The parliamentary comment. Withdraw. Response, Minister of Health. We are actively involved in dealing with this issue. This is a concern for all of us as legislators in this place. It's happening in all of our communities, and we want to make sure that we can provide the sort supports that are necessary. One is consumption and treatment services sites. There's still several that uh, are being reviewed, and we uh, anticipate issuing the licenses for them to continue to the work that they're doing. But it's not just that. It's when people indicate a wish to be rehabilitated that are going to these sites, we need to make sure that those others support services are there. That's why we've indicated that we are putting $3.8 billion over 10 years into mental health and addiction services treatment, because what often happens when people go to these sites and they want to become get into a rehabilitation program, there aren't any detox beds available, and so that opportunity is lost. So it's not just the consumption and treatment services sites, it's the entire progress Once. that people need to take until they can be completely rehabilitated. That is something that we are working on as part of our Total Mental Health and Addictions Plan. Next question, the member for Scarborough, Rouge Park. 
Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Buying a home is one of the largest and most significant investments that Ontarians make. That is true. Many Ontarians have been eagerly awaiting improvements to the new home warranty program in this province after years of liberal inaction. I know that many of my constituents and Ontarians across province are eager to hear more about our government's plan to take action on reforming the broken new home warranty system in Ontario. Many Ontarians and the Auditor General have pointed out that the government's governance of Terion played a central role in the problems with the warranty system. Mr. Speaker, could the Minister please tell this House and new home buyers across Ontario what, government, what our government is doing to fix governance at Terion? The Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member from Scarborough Rouge River for this very important question, because new home buyers in Ontario and new home owners need to have confidence in the system. And our government has made a commitment to take a look at Tarion and make changes that will better protect new home buyers across this province. And that is what we continue to do, Mr. Speaker. Our ongoing reform of new home warranties in Ontario is focused on providing better practices for new home buyers. We inherited a mess, quite frankly, and our plan addresses this by ensuring, and again, I, re I really stress this, we're ensuring that the right leadership and oversight is in place once and for all. And that is why last week I wrote a letter to the chair of Tarion and instructed Tarion to change its governance. These changes will overhaul Tarion's governance so there is a proper balance of consumers and home builders at the board table. Long Thank you very much. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the minister for her answer, her leadership, and taking this important first step that will help put an end to the serious accountability and transparency concerns at Terrio. Our government must ensure Ontarians can have trust in their home warranty system. It was obvious to many that the leadership at Terrio is causing hardship and adding barriers for Ontarians that are seeking help during vulnerable time in their lives. Ontarians need to know that the government is taking sufficient steps to ensure Ontarian is fulfilling its mandate is to, pro is, is to protect Ontarian home buyers and that their intentions are in the right place. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please tell this House about the changes that you instructed Ontarian's chair to make and how these changes will translate into needed improvements to the new home warranty program in Ontario? Minister to reply. Thank you very much. And again, thank you to the member from Scarborough Rouge Park for this important question because we have taken decisive action, Speaker. Since receiving my letter last week, Tarion's CEO and board chair have stepped down to make way for new leadership. This will be a, a team, that, in terms of the new leadership, that will be committed to implementing a new mandate focused on consumer protection. We have listened, Mr. Speaker, and we have acted. Additionally, before Tarion's next annual general meeting, home builders will no longer dominate the board. There will be a new board with members who have specific competencies. Again, we have listened. An overhaul of the board, Mr. Speaker, is an important first step in rebuilding the trust and confidence of Ontarians when it comes to new home ownership. We want people across this province to have better Once. built homes and ensure that we have the right leadership in place to bring forth that change. Thank you very much, here, here, here. Speaker. The member for Brampton North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. There is a long history of complaints of anti-black racism in the Peel District School Board. Since the minister announced the review, black community members, not only in Peel, but across the province have pushed back against the minister's decision to not appoint black reviewers. They know that you need black reviewers at the table to not only contextualize what the community is saying, but to provide recommendations on what is necessary to address anti-black racism in Peel schools. So, Mr. Speaker, my question is very simple. Why did the minister not find it necessary to appoint independent black reviewers to review into anti-black racism in our schools? Mr. Education. 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, as I was asked yesterday this question, I was very pleased to confirm that the government has deputized my Associate Deputy Minister, Patrick Case, who is a human rights leader, who is now going to be part of every single review process, who is a black leader across the province, uh, as well as a human rights advocate in the province. He's one of my ADMs for equity. He's been asked to lead the process of the review, hands-on, at every single review, over 120 to date that have been requested. He'll be at every single review. And so the question fundamentally, I think, is knowing that we have these two reviewers in place, one of which has been doing this in the York Region uh, just previously in a similar issue, knowing that we are immediately, swiftly taking action, I think, Mr. Speaker, the, the point is we should have confidence in the three of them, in Suzanne, Herbert, and Ena Chada, as well as Patrick Case, to sit in to make sure that these parents, these students, and educators have a voice, Bons. they're able to listen, and they're ultimately able to take immediate action to end systemic racism in Peel. Supplementary, the member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and back to the minister. Just to be clear, deputizing the ADM is not the same as having an independent black reviewer assigned to this. Black community members continue to speak out, Mr. Speaker, because we have been here before. Ministers that talk a good talk then return to their offices and ignore report after report telling them how to address the root causes of anti-black racism. The minister announced this review two weeks ago and has still failed to appoint an independent black reviewer. Because of public pressure, we're watching the minister scramble, and he's still failing to address the community's concerns. Right. So again, how are we supposed to trust this minister to help the people District School Board address the root causes of anti-black racism when even public pressure has not made the minister recognize that it is mandatory to have independent black reviewers at the table. Minister. Mr. Speaker, allegations of discrimination and prejudice are unacceptable. When I found out about these reports uh, brought forth to the government, we took immediate action by calling in reviewers. In addition to the two reviewers who have been involved, Anna Chada, who you will know, is from Brampton, is the uh, former vice chair of the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal, Mr. Speaker. She is a person from the leader in the South Asian community that will make a difference in that process. In addition, we've appointed Suzanne Herbert, who's a former deputy minister who's been involved and was a reviewer in the York, Re York Region District School Board, as well as appointing and ensuring that the lead reviewer, the lead individual involved in this process is Patrick Case, a leader in the black community of this province. He's at the table, he's hearing every voice, and he's working with the government, of course, as well as with the reviewers to ensure the weak crack down on systemic racism. The next question, the member for Scarborough Agent Court. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Cultural Industries. Minister, I know you are passionate about volunteerism and recognizing those who have selflessly donated their time to support others. We know Recognizing those who give so freely of their time can go a long way to keeping them motivated and encourage others to donate their time to causes in communities across Ontario. It is why I was proud to recognize dedicated constituents in Scarborough Aging Court during my local volunteer service award ceremonies last month. Minister, can you please tell us how your ministry is recognizing volunteers across the province? Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Thank Industries. Thank you very much, Speaker. I want to commend the member from Scarborough Asian Corps for his question, for attending his local volunteer service awards, and for his dedication in working with the ethnic media in the province of Ontario. And he's put many, many hours of volunteerism himself into this province. Speaker, Margaret Mead once said, never doubt a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only ones who ever have. We like to talk about our spectacular double bottom line in the Ministry of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. We have a, a fueled economy of a $71 billion economic imprint, but more importantly than anything, we actually assist those across the province of Ontario with the cultural fabric of what it means to be an Ontarian. And so much of what it means to be an Ontarian and a Canadian is giving back to your fellow citizens and speaker. That's why the ministry is pleased that we were able to recognize 7,100 committed citizens across the province in more than 50 ceremonies to recognize their good work, Response. including over 700 volunteers that are youth. Since 1986, we have recognized over 250,000 Ontarians who have been committed to giving back to their communities, and I can't wait to talk a little bit. Thank you very much. Thank you. The supplementary question. 
Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the Minister for her work recognizing some of Ontario's most deserving and hardworking volunteers. While I was proud to celebrate those worthy recipients for their hard work and years of dedication during my local ceremony, I know that there are many more volunteers who go unnoticed across the province. Minister, you are able to present a number of volunteer service awards in your riding of Nepean, honoring some who have donated their time to causes for over 25 years. Minister, can you tell us about a few of these amazing volunteer service award recipients and how our government will continue to honor their generosity? Minister. Absolutely uh, commit to honoring our volunteers across the province. That's why I'll be reaching out to all members on both sides of the aisle to ensure that we are uh, continuing to do that in the best manner possible. Let me tell you about a few people we were able to recognize in my own community of Nepean. Tony Lawson, who has given uh, 25 years of his life to the Barhaven Lions Club to make sure we have things like our annual Christmas parade and they fundraise for so many other people. Like Victor Chan, he's a veteran who uh, actually started with a number of other veterans, the uh, newest legion in the, in the province of Ontario, the Barhaven Legion, which has uh, one of the, the top number of uh, members in the entire country. Let me tell you a little bit about Malusi from Brantford uh, with the Polish Alliance Ladies' Circle. She has given 65 years wow. of her life wow. to dedicate to her community. Speaker, we had three members that uh, have given over 50 years, including Bill from Sarnia, Lampton at the Sarnia Silver Sticks, Dawn from Thunder Bay with the St. George's Society, and Krista from Etobicoke North with the St. Patrick's Catholic Church. Speaker, this is the lifeblood of our province. We all should thank our volunteers because they are what makes Thank you. Member for London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Health. Speaker, today we have the Canadian Cancer Society with us. Among the issues they highlighted this morning are the health risks that children and youth face because of vaping. Just last week, the NDP tabled a private member's bill that would strengthen regulation on vaping and help protect the health of young people and all Ontarians. But this government says it needs more time to review studies. Minister, time is of the essence. Will the minister do the right thing and support the NDP's vaping legislation? Questions addressed to the Minister of Health. I thank the member very much for the question. The um, uptake in vaping among our uh, youth is uh, very serious and alarming to all of us because we know that there are situations where vaping can sometimes lead to smoking, which is in the exact opposite direction that we want to see our young people move. I have had a number of consultations with groups of people, including several uh, groups with young people, uh, understanding why young people are starting to vape and, and what, what it would take to get them to stop vaping. We have taken several steps already, which you would know, with the ministerial order which was issued in September requiring hospitals to report to the ministry any issues that seem to be vaping-related pulmonary illnesses. But there's more going on than that. We know that many young people have not sought help yet for their health-related issues. We want them to uh, come forward and seek help. There is an education program, I believe, that's going to be necessary here, both for young people as well as for their parents, as well as for their teachers. There's a lot of work yet to be done, and I look forward to speaking more Response. about the supplementary. The supplementary question. The government may boast that they've responded to this growing health crisis by banning the promotion of vaping products in convenience stores and in gas stations. And what the health minister won't say is that the ban was supposed to come into effect more than a year ago until the government stepped in and paused the ban despite right. warnings from health care experts. Let me remind the Minister of Health of what she said when the NDP asked the exact question months ago. The health minister said, and I quote, I want to protect children as well. This is very important. No one wants to see a young person get started on nicotine. So my question is, will the health minister acknowledge that one year later, she must do more to protect children from vaping by strengthening regulations? Minister? Well, the short answer to the member's question is yes. 
Of course, we recognize we need to do more. We have taken the steps with the ministerial order. We have taken the steps as of January 1st to ban vaping products from being advertised in convenience stores as well as in gas bars. But there's other work that needs to be done, including working with the federal government. The federal government controls a lot of the other types of advertising that you might see at Union Station, that you might see on billboards in other areas. It is an issue that I plan to bring forward with the federal minister as soon as we have our first meeting, which is going to be held in early in the spring, but we are also looking at other issues. I certainly look forward to reviewing the private member's bill. I know that the issue of uh, flavored vapes that seem to be targeting young people is a matter of concern. When you call something peach juice or cotton candy, you're not looking at targeting adults who are trying to use vaping as a smoking cessation product. There's also the issue of the, the nicotine content. The nicotine content is very high in some cartridges. It's, it's a high as a pack of, pack of cigarettes. We are looking Thank at you. all. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Sarnia Lambton. Thank you, uh, Speaker. And my question today is to the Minister of Agricultural Food and Rural Affairs. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, every member in this House that comes from a rural riding knows that it's not easy being a farmer. The whole province relies on them to provide good, safe food each and every day. And yet we are hearing continually concerns that they're not feeling safe in their own homes, in their own workplaces, and on their own farms. I know of farm farmers in my own riding who deal with issues of trespassers on an ongoing basis. I'm even proud to say that in our riding, the city of Sarnia as well, an urban area, uh, passed a resolution highlighting their concern with the safety of farmers and their businesses. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, we rely on farmers to produce and process safe food each and every day. Their own safety and that of their animals and families is a priority. Mr. Speaker, will the minister tell us about our government's proposed legislation on this issue and how it will help farmers in Ontario? Good Great question. question. Surveyor Culture, Food, Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Sarnia Lambton for that excellent question. Mr. Speaker, we've received hundreds of letters about trespassing on farms and agri-food yeah. premises and obstruction to livestock transport trucks. We cannot sit back and allow farmers to continue feeling unsafe in the vital work that they do. That's why our proposed legislation, if passed, will create the necessary deterrence against trespassers with fines of up to $15,000 for the first offence and $25,000 for subsequent event, uh, offences. Our message is clear. People with unauthorized access or uh, obtained access under duress or false pretense should not be trespassing on farms and livestock transport. We're protecting farmers, we're protecting animal health and safety, Spons. and we're protecting the integrity of our food. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that response. People who joined us in the legislature on Monday when this bill was introduced saw the overwhelming response and positive response from our rural community and farm organizations. However, Many people in Ontario wish to know more about how this government and your ministry, through this proposed legislation, is encouraging animal welfare and safety. Farmers maintain sensitive protocols to ensure that their livestock are not exposed to undue stress or disease. This process is crucial to keep our food system and standards safe. I don't think a single member of this House would disagree that food safety is a paramount issue. I also don't think that anyone here would disagree that animal welfare and safety is also important. Right again, will the minister please tell us about how the proposed legislation will address these issues? Thank you. Hey. Minister. Well, thank you again, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank you to the member for the exceptional supplementary. And we, want to, we want everyone to know that animal welfare is a top priority for our government. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, first I want to remind people that anyone who suspects animal abuse should immediately call the authorities to report it. Our proposed legislation provides that the people who are enforcing animal health and welfare legislation have access to private property. Our government has always been deeply committed to animal welfare. Trespassers may not realize how their actions could lead to the introduction of disease among livestock and provide them with undue stress in the process. Animal cruelty is a serious issue. If passed, our legislation would strike the right balance and ensure protection for farmers as well as their animals and the integrity of Ontario's food supply. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker. 
Next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I want to introduce you to Roland. Roland is an 86-year-old senior who lives by himself in a one-bedroom apartment on Walmer Road. And Roland has lived in that apartment for nearly 50 years. But Roland just received an eviction notice which says that he has to move out because the owner, a numbered anonymous corporation, wants the building to be renovated. The property manager says all tenants have to be out, even though none of the permits for the renovations have been filed. Roland has built his life on, Wal on Walmer Road, and he doesn't think he'll be able to afford another place on his fixed income. Minister, why is this government doing nothing to protect vulnerable seniors like Roland from losing their homes? The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, I want to thank the honourable member for the question. I want Roland to know that our government is doing a lot in the housing space. We've worked very diligently Order. since the first day we were elected, recognizing that this province has a housing supply problem. It's a crisis right across Ontario. No matter where you go Order. in this province, uh, we need more housing and more choice for people. We made some very quick decisions. We worked on uh, uh, the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe almost immediately upon being elected, and we're going to continue to work in, in that space uh, to provide intensification around major transit zones and to build more housing and provide more housing opportunities. We're reviewing the provincial policy statement because uh, as the planning playbook for the province, we need to work with our municipal partners on getting more housing built as fast as possible. And we've got a great uptake by our Response. 47 service managers and our two Indigenous program administrators. You know, Speaker, I want to say to the member, I want to say to Roland, I want to say everyone in the province, we need to all work together. We need to leverage every single dollar that we have in the system provincially, that the federal government has, and that our municipal partners have. The supplementary question. Back to the minister. Minister, Roland is not going to be able to afford a 500-square-foot bachelor condo right next to a transit development that costs up to $3,000 to rent, because that is what this government is building. Since taking office, this government has sided with developers time and time again, and they have done nothing to make life better for tenants like Roland. This government has scrapped rent control on new units, they have sat by and allowed rents to skyrocket, and they have done nothing to stop the rise of rent evictions like the one that has happened to Roland and thousands of people across this province. Minister, what are you going to do to help people like Roland and the people all across this province that are suffering from illegal rent evictions? Can members please take their seats? Minister to reply. Speaker, over the first 10 months in 2019, there has been 3,838 rental starts in the Toronto area. Speaker, that's the most rental starts since 1992. <laughs> Developers have nearly 53,000 new units of rental housing planned for the Toronto area in the third quarter of 2019 alone. And again, uh, don't take my word for it, Speaker. RBC Economics, over the last 12 months, purpose-built rental apartment completion surged to a quarter-century high of 4,300 units in the Toronto area. Speaker, even with those statistics, there is much more work we need to do. We need to work with every single person, not just people who build homes, but also all three levels of government. We need to ensure that we're doing everything possible to build nonprofit housing, to build community housing, Pause. to re to retain, repair, and also grow. I just got off the phone speaking Opposition to to over the heckles with my federal colleague, Minister Hussein. We had a tremendous conversation before. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Perth Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. Um, my question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. For 15 years, uh, the previous Liberal government ignored and neglected an industry that is extremely important to communities across rural and northern Ontario, all the while supported by the NDP. I was pleased to see the Minister announce today the release of a draft forest sector strategy as a first step to unlocking the full potential of Ontario's forestry sector. It is easy to see how much passion that the minister has for the forestry sector, and I am confident that his hard work, the sector will finally be back on the right track. Can the minister please inform the House on the next steps 
now that the new draft strategy has been released. Questions to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I want to thank the great member for his question as well. I was really pleased, and yes, I am passionate about this industry, and I was really pleased to announce today that we have a plan to help the forest industry grow and thrive. Throughout the past year, I held seven roundtables all across the province, speaking directly with industry, Indigenous communities and other stakeholders, which led to the development of this plan. Our draft forest strategy will aim to stimulate job creation and promote economic growth, reduce unnecessary burden and cost for businesses, while ensuring that our forests continue to be managed with environmentally conscious ways and with a focus on sustainability. Our government is committed to consulting on this draft strategy, and everyone can comment on it over the next until February 5, 2020, on the EBR registry. Looking forward to hear from the people of Ontario about how we're continuing to move Response. forward and build Ontario together. Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you to the minister for the answer. I'm glad to hear how committed the minister is to creating an environment that will help the forestry sector succeed in the province of Ontario. It's unfortunate that the Liberals gave up on forestry in Ontario, costing the sector both jobs and further investment in the province. Shameful. However, it is clear the minister and our government are focusing on regaining those jobs and making Ontario open for business. Could the minister please explain how the draft strategy will support a sector that is critical to so many communities across this province, generating over $16 billion in revenue and supporting approximately 155,000 direct and indirect jobs across Ontario? Minister. Thank you, Thank you to the member again for his, uh, question, for his supplemental. Ontario is recognized as a global leader in sustainable forest management, and the draft forest strategy outlines our plan to help the sector grow and adapt to needs of an emerging and future market. The draft strategy is built on four main pillars, promoting stewardship and sustainability, putting more wood to work, improving cost competitiveness, and fostering innovation, markets, and talent. The draft strategy also outlines an $84 million investment our government is making to improve Ontario's forest resource inventory, which will inform forest management planning and decision-making in the future. This is a critical step that will help support future work, put more wood to work, and ensure that we are doing sustainable forestry recognized around the world as a leader right here in Ontario. Thank you. The next question, member for Waterloo. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health. Last December, the Cambridge Ambulance Communication Centre was relocated to Hamilton due to staffing shortages. Staff were told the move would be temporary, but ministry delays have dragged this process out for a full year. Today, there are finally enough staff to return to Cambridge, but because of a black mold problem and technical issues, they've been delayed yet again to January 2020. Ambulance dispatch staff whether they're in Cambridge or Thunder Bay, play a critical role in our health care system. The government shouldn't be making their lives more stressful. Can the minister provide assurances to dispatchers that those issues that will be addressed and that staff will be able to return to Cambridge by January 2020? Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, I thank the member very much for the question, and I agree with her that ambulance staff and the services that they provide are fundamental to the operation of our health care system. We know that there have been some issues in your area that they are being resolved. We want to work with them to make sure they can continue to do the great work that they do. As the member will also know, we are doing a complete review and updating our technology across the province to make sure that we can respond in a timely manner when there's a request for emergency services. We are working with Mr. Jim Pine, who is consulting with muni municipalities across the province to up understand the best method of moving forward. We are continuing to make our investments in ambulance services. We're increasing by 4 percent our investments over this year, and we'll continue to invest because she, the member is absolutely right that these are absolutely essential services. The supplementary question. Well, thank you very much. Again to the minister. Over the last year, Cambridge Dispatch Frontline 
frontline workers have gone above and beyond their scope of duty, despite their hard work. Persistent delays from management and this government and a lack of direction mean another holiday away from their families. And for the ministry, this means incurring thousands of dollars in additional costs, including mileage and travel time and accommodation. This decision was never fully thought out. It was not in the best interest of the dispatchers, who have a very stressful job. And indeed, this is a, a, absolutely a waste of money. So why hasn't the government done more to return Cambridge workers back to their home, Minister. Mr. Bell. Well, work has already been done. We are working to make sure that they can return and that they can be in their home communities and continue the services that they're doing. Patient safety is our top priority, and we are committed to reducing ambulance offload delays and other delays that are related. I recognize there's a particular issue in uh, your community, and that is something that we are working hard to rectify because we want to make sure that our ambulance personnel are able to continue the work that they're doing to be able to focus on the needs of patients which is what our system is about at the end of the day. So we will make sure that we offer whatever services we can to make sure that they are up and running, that people are back in their home communities and they're able to offer the services that patients and families need in their own home jurisdictions. Thank you. The next question, the member for Mississauga Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. In my riding and throughout the whole city of Mississauga, I am lucky to see the beauty that art and culture creates, as well as the joy it brings to families and fellow citizens. In fact, in addition to the various programs that are offered throughout the city and supported by our government, we have permanent public art that is accessible and available to be enjoyed by all. These permanent pieces, like the Gala Gateway and the Gala Procession sculptures, tell many stories and draw their inspiration from elements of Canada and the dynamism of performing arts. Minister, you speak so passionately about our need to support all artists so they can share their stories with others across the province. Can you please tell us how your ministry's support for art and culture is allowing artists to continue to share stories that shape Ontario's cultural identity? Mr. Heritage, Tourism, Sport, oh, Culture I appreciate the uh, question from the member from Mississauga. It is incredibly important that we continue to support our artists and our emerging athletes. And One of the opportunities I had just last week with her colleague from Mississauga, Rudy Cazzetto, uh, was attending uh, an event with a number of artists from Canada who were nominated for awards in Hollywood. Speaker, I always say that we're the world in one province, but we have world class artists who are showcasing their talents from Ontario around the entire world. And that's why we're very excited to be supporting the Ontario Arts Council with a total of $61.1 million in grants that go to emerging artists throughout the entire province. And last week I had the opportunity to see a number of artists in residence at Harbourfront with the Minister of uh, Children, Community and Social Services as well as the Associate Minister of Children and Women's Issues. Speaker. Our artists across Ontario are contributing to the double spectacular bottom line that we talk about. They are they are creating great works that we're exposing to the rest of the world, but they're also contributing Response. to the bottom line of our economy to the tune of $71 billion. Thank you, Speaker. That concludes our time for question period this morning. I beg to inform the House that the following documents have been tabled. A report concerning the review of the Cabinet Minister's and Opposition Leader's expense claims complete as of December 2, 2019, from the Office of the Integrity Commissioner of Ontario, and the 2019 Annual Report from the Office of the Auditor General of Ontario. We now have a deferred vote on a motion for closure on Government Order No. 26 relating to changes to the standing orders. Call in the members. This is a five-minute bell.
and ask the members to please take their seats. On November 27, 2019, Mr. Calandra moved Government Notice of Motion No. 73, now Government Order 26 as amended, relating to changes to the standing orders. On November 28, 2019, Mr. Bisson moved an amendment, and on December 2, 2019, Ms. Singh Brampton Centre moved an amendment to the amendment. Ms. Hogarth has moved that the question now be put. All those in favour of Ms. Hogarth's motion will please rise one at a time and be recognised by the clerk. Ms. Mr. Calandra. Mr. Calandra. Mr. Yurik. Mr. Yurik. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Lecce. Ms. Mulroney. Ms. Mulroney. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Elliott. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Smith Bay of Quincy. Mr. Smith Bay of Quincy. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Sakari. Mr. Sakari. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Ms. Sermon. Ms. Sermon. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Ms. Kanji. Ms. Kanji. Mr. Cho Willadale. Mr. Cho Willadale. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Miller Perry Sam Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sam Muskoka. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Ms. Midas. Ms. Midas. Mr. Tanagaslin. Mr. Tanagasa. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Babber. Mr. Babber. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Kusindova. Ms. Kusindova. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Carhalios. Mrs. Carhalios. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Mr. Cusetto. Mr. Cusetto. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Triant. Ms. Triantafilopoulos. Ms. Triantafilopoulos. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Baumer. Mr. Baumer. Mr. Smith. Peterborough Quarter. Mr. Smith. Peterborough Quarter. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Sandu. Ms. Gamar. Ms. Gamar. Mr. Kanapathy. Mr. Kanapathy. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Sabau. Mr. Sabau. Mademoiselle Simard. <clears throat> and those who are opposed to Ms. Hogarth's motion will please rise one at a time. Monsieur be recognized Bisson. by the clerk. Monsieur Bisson. Monsieur Bisson. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Singh Brampton Centre. Ms. Singh Brampton Centre. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Mamakwa. Ms. Begum. Ms. Begum. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Styles. Ms. Styles. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Mrs. Stevens. Mrs. Stevens. Mr. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Birch. Ms. Birch. Mr. Ms. Burns McGowan. Ms. Burns McGowan. Mr. Bourguin. Mr. Bourguin. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Rakosovich. Mr. Rakosovich. Ms. Monty Farrell. Ms. Monty Farrell. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Schreiner. Mr. Schreiner. The ayes are 61, the nays are 32. The ayes being 61 and the nays being 32, I declare the motion carried. <laughs> Mr. Calandra has moved government notice of motion number 73 relating to changes to the standing orders. Is it the pleasure of the House that the motion carry as amended? I heard some noes. All those in favour of the motion will please say aye. 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 All those opposed will please say nay. nay. In my opinion, the ayes have it. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell. Mr. Calandra has moved government notice of motion number 73 relating to changes to the standing orders. All those in favour of the motion as amended will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk.
Mr. Kalanga. Mr. Kalanga. Mr. Yurik. Mr. Yurik. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Lecce. Ms. Mulroney. Ms. Mulroney. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Elliott. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Smith, Bay of Quinty. Mr. Smith, Bay of Quinty. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Debola. Mr. Debola. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Sicario. Mr. Sicario. Mr. Cho Scarborough. Mr. Cho Scarborough. Ms. Serma. Ms. Serma. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Ms. Kanji. Ms. Kanji. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Miller Perry Salmascoka. Mr. Miller Perry Salmascoka. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Ms. Midas. Ms. Midas. Mr. Tanagasla. Mr. Tanagasla. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Babber. Mr. Babber. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Kusindova. Ms. Kusindova. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Carhalio. Mrs. Carhalio. Ms. Park. Mr. Cusetto. Mr. Cusetto. Mr. Pan. Mr. Pan. Ms. Triantafilopoulos. Mr. Triantafilopoulos. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Bauman. Mr. Bauman. Mr. Smith. Peterborough Quartha. Mr. Smith. Peterborough Quartha. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Sandy. Mr. Sandy. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Gamari. Mr. Kanapathy. Mr. Kanapathy. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Sabau. Mr. Sabau. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Schreiner. Mr. Schreiner. Mademoiselle Simard. Mademoiselle Simard. Liberal Tories, single story. All those opposed to the motion as amended will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Linda. Ms. Linda. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Mr. Momacom. Mr. Momacom. Ms. Begum. Ms. Begum. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Ms. Yermonta. Ms. Yermonta. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Stiles. Ms. Stiles. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Mrs. Stevens. Mrs. Stevens. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Singh Brampton. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Carpoche. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Ms. Burns Bagow. Mr. Burns Bagow. Mr. Borgwan. Mr. Borgwan. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Rykosovich. Mr. Rykosovich. Ms. Monty Farrell. Ms. Monty Farrell. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. The ayes are 63, the nays are 30. The ayes being 63 and the nays being 30, I declare the motion carried as amended. This House stands in recess until 3 p.m. <laughs>